All right. Hello, everybody, boys and girls, those who bounce in between. It's your friend, comrade Danky Kang here with our other dear friend and comrade FVK1917. Hey, how's it going, comrades? Yeah, and in today's episode, we are going to be discussing the themes of fascism and genocide. So it's a real pep. Uh, <laughs> um, and a lot of us have seen the recent high profile debate between Caleb Maupin and Vosh and questions about what is fascism, what is genocide, what is state capitalism. All of these things have sort of risen up, uh, risen to the top in terms of uh, the sorts of arguments that I feel like we as online Marxists need to be able to address. So here to talk a little bit about fascism with me uh, is FVK. So uh, we, we were talking a little bit before the, uh, the recording started about what are some of the most defining characteristics of fascism. And um, we, we had mentioned the culture, the culture of fascism. Yeah, that um, like you said a bit ago, you know, this Caleb Boppin debate, it really showed how a lot of us on the left in just the, when I say the left, I mean, the left in general don't really have like a clear understanding of fascism or what genocide is. And um, we're not here as much to comment on the debate itself. But a lot of times when you talk with people, it goes back to these kind of questions and to see Vouch come, you know, call China a fascist country was just mind blowing. And we're not here to necessarily like defend China or anything. Um, my personal position is that they are state capitalist. Um, I do believe that they're the Chinese Communist Party is socialist and that they are working towards a socialist state. But um, if that's the best way to do it, you know, that's another question. I'm just simply laying out where I'm coming from here. But yes. Um, a lot of people seem to get these things confused state capitalism and fascism um, like any state, there are going to be things that are similar to the two, but that doesn't, you know, fascism is a very specific thing. And that's kind of what we want to highlight here is what are the characteristics of fascism? So um, the first one is, that we mentioned was the culture. And by this, I'm mostly like referring to um, the fact that fascism it picks out a specific ethnicity within their state. And they say, this should be, this ethnicity should be raised to the position of the national figure in a way, this should be the embodiment of a citizen of our state. And, you know, in Nazi Germany, we see the concept of the Aryan race and this concept shows up again and again in fascism. Um, but that that's one of the most determining features as far as the cultural side Um but what else about the cultural side? Um, what do you think differenti differentiates fascism, Danky? Yeah, I think when you look at Marxism, it's a very internationally minded movement. We are trying to unite the working class of all mankind, uh, regardless of what their cultural background is. Whereas fascism is a lot more narrower and uh, in its application. It only wants the best for a single ethnicity, a single people group. And usually it's the people group who uh, constitute the elite of society. Like you said, in Germany, it was the Aryans, the Aryan Germans. In fascist Italy, it was the Italian people, not immigrants. Uh, in Japan, it was the Japanese people, not the Koreans, not the Manchurians. So in fascist cultures throughout the world, you see this emphasis on the people, the folk, and we need to be able to protect them. That is essentially one of the key tenets of fascism. There is a rallying around a common culture, a common ethnicity at the exclusion of all others. Yeah, and one of the biggest aspects of this is fascism seems to be very much rooted in some type of fear and that's that's one of the biggest components because 
normally when you have a state that is, you know, nationalism develops, th that is a separate thing, but it is a major component of fascism. But it's pretty much, um, you know, a state with that type of nationalist outlook taking hold um, at the exclusion of everybody else. And that is very much rooted in a fear. It's pretty much saying, oh, all the ills of society. Um, well, don't worry about all this class rhetoric. It's really just a race thing or it's really just something like that. And you are actually the state. And therefore, you know, we should make a state composed of our ethnicity and then everything will be just. So it's a difference in what the solution is. They recognize some of the same problems of society, but it's in nowhere trying to um, rectify a lot of the issues that we bring up. It's merely a way to just kind of put those aside and um, have a strong authoritarian state that can, um, you know, just put those worries under the foot of a boot, essentially, instead of letting it fester up. Right. A lot of fascists will call themselves a third positionist. This is someone who apparently is against capitalism and socialism. They are a third position. But in reality, wherever you find fascism, you find that it is opportunistically protecting the interests of the national bourgeois of whichever country it's taking place in. Uh, in Germany, the Nazi party was backed by the German national bourgeois. In Italy, Mussolini was backed by the Italian national bourgeois. And you can see similar appeals uh, with Donald Trump and his presidency. We need to strengthen American businesses. It's, it's what uh, economists call protectionism. And it is this economic protectionism that is sort of a hallmark of fascist economic policy. They don't necessarily have anything against capitalism. They have a thing against global capitalism because in their mind, global capitalism is taking advantage of the nation. So it needs to be a nationally oriented capitalism, a state capitalism. That sort of leads us back to what we talked about before. Uh, what is state capitalism? Well, it is when the state commands private businesses. This could be through subsidies. This could be through regulations, but uh, this could be through like direct government intervention saying, you know, the uh, X company, you need to build this amount of product. Um, you can see elements of state capitalism in the U.S. economy, especially during the Second World War, where large uh, portions of the economy were uh, briefly nationalized uh, for the war effort. Uh, you can see um, there is a movie called Schindler's List, and it's about Oscar Schindler a capitalist living in Germany during the Nazi times, and he was contracted by the Third Reich to produce military equipment. He skirted around some of the hiring laws by secretly hiring Jews. Uh, he made a list, and that's why the movie's called Schindler's List, because his list essentially saved the lives of these Jewish people and prevented them from being sent to the concentration camps. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's a, a great example because a lot of people are familiar with that movie and it shows how in that time private capitalists were utilized by the state. But I mean, you know, it, it, that doesn't mean it's like socialism or anything like that. And I, as far as like state capitalism goes versus fascism, I, I guess there are similarities um, as far as how the economy is run. But um, you know, there's varying degrees to as far as how much state intervention there is in such like this. Right. And, you know, the main thing that we got to know about fascism, I mean, this is a good thing to say early on, is that it's not totally coherent. You know, I mean, we see this with when people talk about socialism, too. A lot of people aren't coherent with their beliefs. But nonetheless, these fascist movements, they don't they aren't as worried about that as us. So if they contradict themselves that doesn't that doesn't matter to them. They don't really care. They have a generalized goal. Um, so they in different fascist countries, you'll see different um, 
you know, amounts of state intervention. I mean, they're not always going to be the same. And it's very important to point out that in the early days of Nazi Germany, there was a lot of more ideological Nazis who were involved. And these folks, they they believe that they were going to build some type of socialism. I mean, they called it nas- national socialism, right? Right. But they, you know, Hitler says this straight out. He says that Marx was wrong. That's not socialism. What I'm talking about is actually socialism. So it's essentially trying to rebrand socialism. That's what the Nazis were trying to do. Not every fascist movement does that, although they kind of have similar points where they do similar things but um, right yeah. and um i also just wanted to point out as far as culture goes fascism it very much looks to the past it very much says hey guys we were great at one point and this happened and ruined it you know normally that person to blame is some type of minority or some type of war situation and they say therefore we have to you know um bring back that golden age we have to get back to that point make whatever country great again kind of thing and um you know i'm i'm not trying to imply that like donald trump is a fascist um i know a lot of us have different opinions on this but mine is yeah he has tendencies of a fascist he is definitely some type of i think you know danky you've called him like a pseudo fascist before yeah and we see a lot of people uh, leaders who are like this but it's, it's very difficult to diagnose because, yeah, on the one hand, fascism is not coherent. On the other hand, there still are specific things that make one a fascist or not. And we can look at things like the KKK and we can say that looks like a proto-fascist movement. But right. they didn't have any economic um, you know, understanding of fascism because it didn't exist yet, but what my earlier point was, was even when fascism develops and they do try and have their economic um, movement, however they want, you know, in Nazi Germany, that got thwarted. Hitler was like, no, nah, I mean, we're going to still have like private capitalists, like run most of this. It's going to be corporatism to a, to a large extent. And that that's the biggest mm-hmm. thing is because it doesn't want to be coherent. They don't mind throwing away a lot of those past ideals of socialism or like some of them claim. Yeah, a lot, um, a lot of fascists will come along and say, we understand that the system as it is right now, the status quo is broken. And it's not unfeasible to imagine an American fascist coming, coming along saying, the system sucks, the Democratic Party sucks. um, Neoliberalism is terrible. And I am going to rebuild america i'm going to rebuild america for the american people i want every american to have access to uh good housing and health care and education and a good job and you know the emphasis being on american citizens not necessarily everyone that is the distinguishing factor uh one of the distinguishing factors between fascist and communist is that communists want everyone, uh, everyone's standard of living to be elevated, whereas a fascist only wants it for a certain constituent of society. Fascist society emphasizes homogeneity. They don't want diversity. They don't like diversity because diversity to them is a threat to the elite. And ultimately, You know, we were talking about the KKK earlier. The KKK, what they really wanted to do was see a return to the old Confederate system. They wanted the South to rise again. And so they were fighting to defend that economic system, those economic elites, the plantation elites that existed back in those days. And uh, everywhere you see fascism, you see it opportunistically latch itself on to the interests of the national bourgeois um, and gain their support. You also see them opportunistically latch on to the yearnings of the common people, common people who say, we don't like global capitalism. Uh, It is not bringing us prosperity. Neoliberalism is not bringing us prosperity. All it takes is a fascist to come along 
and say, you know who does benefit from global capitalism is the evil Jewish cabal, or it's the Illuminati, or it's the Bilderbergs, or it's this, or it's that. Anyone but the actual elites that they serve. And when they do that, they will sort of uh, capture the minds of the people. And so fascism is very opportunistic in how it will uh, cater to the interest of the elite and the common people uh, simultaneously. Yeah. But in, in action, you see that the fascists don't actually care at all for the people. Um, you know, Hitler led Germany to ruin. Uh, uh, Mussolini led Italy to ruin. Uh, Japan, under Hirohito, was uh, led to ruin. So it's you can see how these fascist leaders would, uh, you know, they would be willing to fiddle while Rome burned around them, basically. They're modern day Nero figures. And you mentioned opportunism. And I think that's the best way to describe it because, you know, earlier I said it's hard to diagnose them because they're not coherent. Well, that opportunism is one of the biggest factors of it because they seem to be willing to attach themselves to very populist sentiments to order in order to gain power. So you look at, well, why did the Nazis, why were they talking about socialism when they were clearly not socialist and antithetical to it? Well, we got to remember a lot of people know this, but socialism was extremely popular at the time. Um, we just, we, we don't see anything like that right now. And the fascists were just co-opting it. You know what I mean? And th that type of opportunism is that something that they all do. So, yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, as far as another characteristic of fascism, another one that we put down here for the second one is um, the crisis of imperialism. And let's see. So if you look at these fascist countries that came about in the 20th century, we see you mentioned, you know, um, Nazi Germany. We got Italy and we got Japan. Well, this was when um, imperialism was it was it was very much developing. And, you know, we know what that is. It's uh, these countries economically subjugating other nations for, um, to enrich yourself. And there were capitalist countries who were kind of left out of this process because there's only so much territory in the world that you can expand on and take over. So these fascist countries, they, you know, like Germany, they were like, wow, we don't, how are we going to develop if we can't play the game? If we're cut out of the game, we're going to be, um, you know, reduced to the level of like a second or third world country. That's the way they perceived of it, at least. So it's very much an economic situation, which leads these countries to being very desperate. That that's the key word. They're very desperate and they need to um, forcefully expand. You know, imperialism, how it normally expands. Lenin talks about this in his book, Imperialism. He says we can see it start to grow when um, capitalists in Western countries begin to build railroads and stuff like that in these other countries. And it's a way for them to kind of claim this territory and um, begin the process of building up institutions from there. But um, yeah, these fascist countries they had to do it by force since they were left out and um you know i'm mostly talking about this because as we mentioned in the vouch slash caleb Maupin debate i mean it is just mind-blowing that he calls china fascist and right. i'm not here to just defend them but like at the end of the day it like he had such a fluid definition of fascism it, like none of these char characteristics that we've mentioned so far and even the ones we're about to get into don't represent China at all. And I, I'm going to be completely honest. I've actually heard this from comrades before, um, like dedicated Marxist Leninists who have said, mm -hmm. I mean, is China kind of fascist? Cause it's like state capitalism. But um, you know, as far as my understanding goes, it's like where we haven't even hit any of these char characteristics with China yet. So it's just, um, it's just like hard to understand. But yeah. to see why people make this difference. But um, I'm curious what you think about the the crisis of imperialism and how that helps, um, you know, 
develop a fascist movement in these countries. Yeah. Um, well, f first, uh, in, in regard to like the China um, state capitalist question, I feel like it's important to distinguish state capitalism in a country in which the state is a bourgeois state versus state capitalism in a country where the state is controlled by the proletariat. And, you know, when you look at uh, the USSR during the new economic policy period, when you look at China uh, in their current period, you see a country that, yes, it has state commanded capitalist enterprises, but the state is being led by a proletarian party. And I think the difference, you know, between China's state capitalism and say like uh, Nazi Germany's state capitalism is that the German government was catering exclusively to the interests of the national German bourgeois. It was very much the national bourgeois who were in charge, you know, the ones who are Nazi sympathizers, which most of them were. Uh, I'm not saying that Schindler's List is like a perfectly historically accurate movie, but in that movie, you watch it, you get a sense that all of Oscar Schindler's capitalist buddies were in deep cahoots with the Nazi party. They were all collaborators. And so, uh, you know, meanwhile, during, in Russia, during the NEP times, the New Economic Policy times, there were private capitalists that were uh, propped up and briefly, you know, subsidized by the government, but they were never allowed to enter into political power. Uh, we talked in a previous, uh, I think this was an Iron Curtain episode, but we talked about how the Chinese Communist Party has millions and millions of members and only a few thousand of them are actually capitalists. So, you know, when you consider the ratio from uh, in, in the CPC between the working class and the capitalist class, uh, the capitalists are in just ultimately dwarfed by the overwhelming amount of, you know, working class people consisting of the CPC. But um, with regards to the crisis of imperialism, Lenin points this out in his book, Imperialism, uh, where the world has essentially been carved up into zones of control by the various European imperial powers. Britain controls vast portions of the Americas and of Africa and India. France controls Vietnam and other parts of Africa and parts of South America. Spain controls large parts of Central and South America, etc. Well, uh, you know, FEK, you raised a good point where all these uh, late to the game imperialist powers like Japan and uh, Italy and Germany felt like they were, you know, late to the party, late to the game. And so they wanted to get in on this imperialism scheme too. But unfortunately, there were no other lands left to conquer. And so the only way forward was uh, a, a world war, an imperialist world war. And we had two of them. We had World War I, we had World War II which were direct consequences of this imperialist rivalry. And there's been sort of a lull in this imperialist rivalry recently because of the Cold War, um, because of the United Nations and NATO. And these treaties and, and these organizations are put into place uh, ideally to stave off this imperialist crisis but we can see now, even despite like the United States is like clear global hegemony, they are being challenged and various European countries are starting to say, we cannot rely on Uncle Sam any further. We need to become more independent as a country. Uh, you've seen other countries, you know, with the same sentiment about the European Union in general. Uh, so you are starting to see these sort of uh, bourgeois alliances between all the Western countries begin to sort of crumble away and give rise instead to these sentiments of independence and protectionism. And I think that is fertile breeding ground for fascism to grow. Um, 
in France, you had Marine Le Pen, who ran against uh, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, she was, you know, you could very uh, easily label her a pseudo fascist in the same light as Donald Trump. Um, you had Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. Uh, you have uh, Matteo Salvini in Italy. So this trend of new fascism or pseudo fascism is popping up and we are beginning to sort of see the Western world, the bourgeois controlled, you know, motherland, the core imperialist countries start to uh, crumble in their alliances with one another. Yeah, th that's a very good point. I mean, I think that kind of leads us to the next um, characteristic here. And that's that we, um, let's see, we wrote down that fascism, it very much diverts class struggle. And right. by that, I mean, like, let's think about this. So we have this crisis of imperialism. And this is something that the Western countries have noticed. So as you mentioned, they created the United Nations and things like this to get a little more cooperation so they wouldn't be engaged in these imperialist wars all the time. And see, here's the biggest thing is that whenever the um, you know capitalist crisis happens at home, um, we know that people can either go towards a socialist kind of understanding, a class conscious understanding of the problems of society, or they can be, or they can understand that whole, oh, well, this must be a race thing, or this must be a, you know, something that's a little more animalistic and a little easier to just tap into. And right. um, fascism presents that alternative. It pretty much says, hey, instead of the um, antithesis being, that we're going to have a socialist revolution. It will be a, a revolution of the um, real people of the nation. And that that's the disturbing thing about fascism is it's something that, you know, Karl Marx probably wouldn't have been able to foresee, but it very much requires workers support. And if you're going to have a fascist country, sure, it's brutal and authoritarian, but at the end of the day, you're going to need popular worker support. And these fascist countries were able to do that by selling these people some type of weird um, answer to these issues. They were able to, um, you know, entrench themselves in power. So that's one of the most disturbing things about it to me. And right. it, um, this is something that was brought up in the Caleb Moffin and Bausch debate. Um, I, there was a moment. I mean, somebody can check back on this and correct me if I'm wrong. But I could swear there was a moment where Caleb Moffin, he says, that fascism is extremely anti-communist and Bausch, he laughs and he's like, he just kind of chuckles at it. Right. And I, I, he didn't go into any further detail, but I, I just thought that looked kind of bizarre because if he was kind of chuckling because he thinks that fascism doesn't require anti-communism, that's just silly because fascism seeks to divert class consciousness. It is very concerned about communism and it is very concerned about suppressing them. And that's why we see in Nazi Germany, the communists were the first ones who were sought out and thrown into concentration camps. Um, we even see the fascist countries of the 20th century. They, let's see, that was Italy, Germany, and Japan. They had the anti turn pact, you know, and that's just directly calling out the turn. So they were united on that front that they hated communism. And of course, Hitler's Mein Kampf makes this very clear and even goes as far to claim that, yeah, Marx was wrong about socialism. He doesn't know what it is and we're really creating socialism. So therefore these communists must be destroyed so we can really be, we can build our real version of socialism. Right. Um, to be ignorant of the fact that fascism is anti-communist is to ultimately show the world just how, how ignorant you really are about these subjects because communism at, at the core of the communist movement is the idea of the class struggle and fascists like like i said before have this almost like lasellian concept where they want to reconcile the class antagonisms and in that aspect they are very similar to social democrats because social democrats will tell you the same thing they will put a band-aid over the brutal exploitation of capitalism 
and say that uh, their system, uh, their uh, bold new system fixes all the problems. And fascists will do the same thing. They'll, they will propose these solutions, which ultimately won't dethrone the bourgeois from power in any way. It's not a true revolution at all, because the class dynamics haven't been inverted. But it is a way for the bourgeois to save themselves. It's a way for them to put on some sunglasses and go up to all the kids and say, I'm hip, I'm cool, I know what's up. You know, don't lynch me. Don't uh, whip out the guillotines just yet. Don't send me to the gulag because, uh, you know, I'm cool. <laughs> it It is their uh, last ditch attempt to woo the working class into complacency to say, hey, we understand we've heard your complaints and we are fixing things. And so we will put this new shiny coat of paint on a crumbling house and we will call it a renovation. That's exactly what fascism is. That's exactly what social democracy is. And, you know, that's not to say that social Democrats are fascist, but it is, they are the same in that they will attempt to mask over the brutality of capitalism. And in that aspect, they are both equally reactionary. They're, they're both pitching themselves as an oper uh, as, as an alternative to real revolution to real change yeah and some you know some people may say that's a, a little too simplistic but i think that's a great way to visualize it when you said you know they're just simply putting on new glasses and saying hey look at me i mean it is a it, it is a radical change right but the mode of production has not changed at all and right. if we are going to understand like the concept of revolution as marxists we got to understand, yeah, you need a radical change in the mode of production. So um, that was obviously yeah. not done. I mean, we, we can't say that there was a change in the mode of production um, during the times of the New Deal. I mean, it took on new features. It functioned differently, but um, it doesn't do that. And I think a lot of communists can agree on that point in particular. But I think that why that's relevant to, uh, you know, somebody who might say China's fascist I, w I would just love to know when that change happened. When did they change to like a fascist state? You know, it, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really make sense. And, you know, you can't really try and make sense of it too much because you'll just hurt yourself. Cause I mean, even look at mainstream press. I mean, yeah, they suck, but they have to be a little realistic with these terms at times. And they would probably love to call China fascist, but I mean, even they have like common sense enough to be like, Oh yeah, they're not a fascist country. Like they never pop up when you look them up. So yeah, that's just silly. But yeah. was there any um before we get into the concept of um, genocide here? Was there any last um, comments on fascism that you had? I know there's a lot more to this, but we just kind of wanted to bring up some of the the main features of it. But was there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah. Um. So someone might cite China's you know quote unquote nationalism and. We can talk about how most of the socialist countries that have arisen in, in the world have started out as wars of national liberation. Cuba, uh, Vietnam, China, they were all trying to throw out these foreign imperialist powers. And so a lot of these socialist struggles began as wars of national liberation. But you can differentiate this from fascism's, you know, uh, quote unquote, struggle of national liberation, because the fascists are struggling against an enemy that doesn't exist. They're struggling against the the global evil Jewish Bilderberg Illuminati cabal that that doesn't exist. It's a boogeyman that they made up to demonize minorities. Whereas, you know, in these wars against national liberation, China was struggling against the invading Japanese. Uh, Vietnam was struggling against the French and the Americans. So it's, yeah, it's just something worth noting that just because your struggle began as a war of national liberation doesn't make you this hyper-nationalistic fascist uh, country. And I think a fundamental misunderstanding of state capitalism is a 
is, is one of the main reasons why we will sometimes see China being misbranded as a fascist country. I think anybody who understands the class nature of fascism, how it ultimately endorses the bourgeois, will laugh at claims that China is a fascist country. I think anybody who examines the claims that, or anybody who examines that how fascism is culturally homogenous, how it demands homogeneity from its, from its people, and how it is fiercely xenophobic, I feel would laugh in the face of China, a country which has embraced its ethnic diversity. Um, so moving on from that, there is a discussion about genocide. What constitutes genocide? Because there are claims now that China is committing a genocide of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang. And I feel like as Marxist Leninist, we are always going to be faced with these sorts of claims, claims about whether or not the Holodromor, the Ukrainian famines in the 1930s were a genocide or not. Um, claims about whether or not what the Chinese are doing in Zhejiang is a genocide of the Uyghur people. And uh, you had looked up a definition of genocide from the United Nations. Um, yeah, let me let me pull that up here. Um, okay. Yeah, so let's see. The United Nations Genocide Convention, it defines genocide as, quote, acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. As such, including the killing of its members, causing serious bodily harm, um, seriously bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately imposing living conditions that seek to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Um, so, yes, there that is a broad definition of genocide, and... We can look at it in two ways. So we obviously think of death camps and the 20th century understanding of genocide in that sense, like the Nazis. And right. I mean, it was very blatant. It was literally death done on like a factory industrial scale. Um, it's something we haven't seen before, but it was nonetheless a genocide. And we can also look at as another example, something like the Native Americans, of course. Um, sure, this wasn't a genocide done with like factory style death camps, but it was done through some of the other means that they mention here. They mention um, what they refer, they're kind of referring to forced assimilation, like very, very forced. And, um, you know, we can see obviously the native Americans were just killed outright. Um, they were killed with diseases and um, they were very much forced to adopt Western um understanding and western cultures and such so that's a genocide of somebody's culture and of their people obviously so that would constitute as such um and it it gets it gets difficult because you know we all know that they throw around these terms so loosely like dictator and genocide and even fascism and um you know what constitutes something a genocide and Look, I mean, you mentioned like the Uyghur situation and the Holodomor, and those are two very good examples of where um, the international community or the West, to be honest, looks at a country and says, oh, well, you're doing a genocide, too. And therefore, you're like fascism, therefore, because um, that's what they do. Right. You know, it's kind of it's kind of that kind of thing going on. And, right. Um, so, yeah, I guess um, let, let's. Let's take these two cases then, um, since we're using specific cases of like proclaimed genocide. We've already agreed that the Nazi, the Holocaust done by the Nazis was a genocide. The um, what was done to the American Indians was a genocide. Um, so yeah, uh, in your own words, Danky, um, let's take the Holodomor. What makes the Holodomor like not a genocide to you? Well. First of all, when you look at things like the Native American genocide, you see a coordinated systemic plan to destroy these people's culture, um, to essentially confine them to the mo to the worst land, you know, the reservations, uh, 
are not on fertile, mineral-rich territories. They're in the poorest areas. And so it is a coordinated systemic attempt to destroy a culture or a people. And when you try to investigate the Ukrainian famines, you come across the the Haladromor, you know, I'm going to call it a conspiracy theory because it really is a conspiracy theory. You see immediately some major red flags. Uh, first of all, anybody who investigates the Holocaust, anybody who investigates the Native American genocide, the evidence is there for the whole world to see. It, it, it is overwhelming and it is abundant. So anyone can go out there and verify what happened. Um, but the Haladromor... The only evidence we get of this are from extremely biased sources. Ukrainian fascists, you know, these far right uh, Ukrainian nationalists who were organizing anti Jewish pogroms. And we also get Nazi sympathizing journalists uh, and, and, and uh, media tycoons in Western countries uh, purporting these theories. The sources that they cite are dubious at best, heavily biased, and they uh, their reports are unverifiable. And in fact, we have contemporaneous reports at the time from trusted news sources that actually uh, cast severe doubt on, on the validity of any statements made a, about the Haladromor. Uh, there are claims that the entire Ukrainian region was starving and undergoing a famine. And at the same time, there was a reporter in Moscow who hadn't heard anything about this famine that, uh, you know, the Western media was running wild with the news and reporting it to everyone. Yeah. And um, I believe that journalist, his name was Luis Fisher. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they knew that there was some sort of um, shoot, uh, sorry, food shortage going on. But um, this whole idea of just a massive millions dying famine he was just blown away he was like there's he's he was open to the idea but he went and investigated in ukraine and was like this is not even real <laughs> and right. this was a person who was like a major western news source that's the thing about the holodomor and if you look at um, western news media at the time they were questioning it they weren't on board with it in the beginning it there was the new york times um Oh man, there was so there was a couple others, and there was journalists who were picking this apart. You know, this is something that we, you know, it feels like we have to do this now, but really, this was done in the 30s for the most part by journalists, right. and they were there. So they're some of the best sources that we have, and um, there's a lot to talk about with the Holodomor. Um, as you mentioned, the Ukrainian nationalists they were just super. Um, dishonest with the way that they presented this. They had a political goal and the Nazis, they were very much involved. They were sending, um, you know, they, like you pointed out, the Hearst press was, they were doing the news for the Nazis. They were like right. their news organization and they were the ones who were putting out these stories. So why was Nazi Germany so worried about showing that the USSR was doing some sort of genocide? Well, it's very obvious because in the 30s, they were preparing to do or were in the middle of committing their genocide. <laughs> and it, it, it only it only makes sense. And th they were trying to essentially make the USSR look worse. Like they like, oh, well, they're already doing this, too, kind of thing. And that was before the world knew about the concentration camps in Germany. So, um, yeah, it. it, it that's essentially where the whole lot of more comes from. There's a lot written about that. Honestly, I would I would put it out there for everybody to look up um you know fraud famine and fascism there's actually an audio book of that here on youtube but um let's see i believe finnish bolshevik put it out on his other channel but it's just comprehensive when you look at this evidence and this is something vouch couldn't understand right and he was like oh questioning the official narrative huh and I I'll, I'll just talk about myself very briefly here but i went through the same kind of experience because I came across Nazi, um, you know, denying the Nazis did a Holocaust. I came across that stuff like, um, oh, oh, my God, like several years ago. But I saw that it was just kind of bullshit. And I was glad. I'm, I'm glad that I saw through it. And so when I came across that people were doing a similar thing in our movement here on the left, 
I was I was pretty distraught. I was like, this doesn't seem like leftism. This seems like um, something very wrong and something very weird. But look, I mean, it, it, it was a very effective propaganda tool. And that's why you can't like defend, you can't not defend these existing socialist countries because that's why these genocide claims are put there. It's a way for people to be like, oh yeah, I want some type of leftist movement, but you know, that's, that's terrible and we can't ever want to do a genocide. Right. So it's an right. easy way to appeal. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, uh, no. oh, you mentioned no. some things earlier. I would just like to mention about genocide. There has to be clear intent. There has to be a mass systematic campaign. Um, and I guess it could happen in a situation from neglect. If you say we're going to neglect this region and we're just going to, I guess that's what some are saying was maybe done in the whole lot of more that they just neglected him so bad. But the problem is the narrative has changed over time. I forget the Ukrainian word for a lot of more, but it pretty much implies that it, it implies the word man-made. That's, that's what it means in Ukrainian. So right. the definition itself is outdated. And that's why a lot of historians, they won't call it that anymore because there is not proof of that systematic kind of effort on the Communist Party's part to kill all these people and destroy their national heritage or whatever. And yeah. one last thing I'll say about the whole lot of more is you mentioned that they these Ukrainian nationalists were doing pogroms. And you, if you look at the writings on it, these are the same people that are writing about the whole lot of more. If you look at the writings, it's disgusting. They pretty much try and defend their pogroms. They're like, oh, well, what the USSR is doing is bad, but our pogroms were in self-defense. That's the way they viewed it. And um, and yeah, it, it's pretty disgusting because they would actually, after these pogroms, there was a city in Russia. Um, I'm picturing it in my head. I can't pronounce it. It starts with a K, but they were um, they discovered a site in the 40s where there was a mass grave. And the Ukrainian nationalists, they said, hey, look, here's what the USSR did. But in reality, they checked the bodies, did all the evidence. Sure enough, these were people that were just killed by the Ukrainian nationalists. Or sorry, they were killed by the Nazis when they came in during World War II. Right. So it's just rebranding disasters that actually did happen to try and make it look like, oh, it was the evil Soviet Union. Yeah. So why, why has it become associated with Holocaust denial to deny the Haladramor. And I think, I think it just comes from a lack of investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was trying to explain this to Vosh fans in his chat, but you need to be able to check your sources. And when you check your sources and you find that it's being pushed out by the Hoover Institution or the National Endowment of Democracy or some other, you know, bourgeois funded source, yeah, you have to you have to question the validity about what they're saying. And with with the Holocaust, the evidence is overwhelming. It is absolutely overwhelming. Even if you wanted to uh, deny that the Holocaust existed, someone could just take you to the Auschwitz camp, point to the finger marks in the walls of the gas chambers and say, yeah, uh, explain this. Someone could point to the Nuremberg footage you know, and say, explain this. But meanwhile, with the Haladromor, you have, first of all, no evidence that it was deliberately orchestrated. Why in the world, uh, you know, from a practical standpoint, why in the world would the USSR orchestrate a famine in their own country? Ukraine is the breadbasket of the USSR, uh, or was. So why in the world would they want a famine to break out in their country, which had just recently um, sustained a civil war. You know, they had previously gone through two revolutions. They had fought in World War One. They were tired. But and yet, you know, somehow the Communist Party aims to benefit by starving their own people. Um, I just don't really see the connection there from a logical standpoint. Uh, let alone like an evidence standpoint. But uh, another thing that sort of uh, raises uh, the question is that they'll also blame collectivism. So you can't really have it both ways. It's like, was Stalin trying to punish the Ukrainian people uh, for some reason? 
uh, and that's why he he made this famine, or was it because Stalin was a stupid, dumb poo poo head whose policies made everyone starve? Y they can't. <laughs> they want to have it both ways, but but they can't. <laughs> right, and the inconsistency is what really exposes itself. And yeah, I mean, you know, Vouch he kept going back to, oh, you're just questioning the historical narrative, and yeah, it, it just blows my mind that. Apparently, I mean, I knew this was here, but it's just another thing to see it like right in front of your face. There are a lot of people who are general leftists, quote unquote, who they are so much Western chauvinists. They believe right. the Western media to like a, such a large degree. And one thing that Vouch kept saying in reference to the Uyghur situation in Xinjiang was he kept saying that the official narrative is already set. He said he was pretty much implying that the, the a narrative is just established. It, you're pretty much a revisionist of contemporary events if you're going to say that it was otherwise. And look, I mean, if Bausch really cared about the Uyghur people, he would be doing some more investigation into it because he would find that they are actually not. I mean, they have a lot of problems there in Xinjiang with terrorism and, um, you know, they're trying to quell that as best as they can. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Vouch just saying that like this is a complete genocide and that you are questioning the historical narrative and that that therefore is wrong. That's just weird because as Caleb Maupin pointed out, there have been I mean, look, you can look back all through American history, the Gulf of Tonkin, all these situations where they just flat out lie to us. And I, I just don't see how somebody who's a leftist couldn't agree with that. But I think it does come back to on one hand. I think there is a hint of anti-intellectualism in people like Vouch. They right. think that you think you're some type, you're sitting on some type of high horse. If you sit around and read books and do weird <laughs> shit like that, when really it's like, if you're going to talk firmly on this stuff, you should at least research the situation. And if Vouch was having like a more nuanced argument and saying like, Oh, well maybe, you know, this or that, but to just say, Oh, it's settled. And you can't change that. And you're being revisionist. And that, that's not a place to have a, a debate. And that's what makes him such a poor debater. But he, he even said, my lack of, you know, history is not my strong point. And <laughs> that was very, that was very made clear in his debate with Maupin. Um, so I'm curious what you think about this whole, like, challenging the historical narrative. Because I can see why people think it's problematic. There are other movements who do this. Um, you know, there are people, I don't know, you see it in all kinds of places and not all these are bad, I right. say, but like you can see people like, oh, I'm challenging the narrative on this conspiracy theory or this or that. Um, but I mean, Vouch, he's, I guess he is, he, how can he deny that he's not challenging any narratives? He's supposedly fighting for socialism. You're going to have to fight against some narratives, mainstream narratives at, at, at the very least. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think... Honestly, Vosh, he will say he's fighting for socialism, but in reality, he's not a leftist. He, Vosh is not a leftist. He's a fake leftist. He really showed himself to be, I, I wouldn't have said this before, before the debate, I wouldn't have said this, but he really does sound like a neoliberal. He, he is. I mean, he shills for Biden, uh, but I mean, regardless, the fact that he calls it the official narrative and... You know, how, how dare you, sir? How dare you go against the official narrative? You know, it just shows his bias because I would tell him, no, I'm not arguing against the official narrative. Uh, to do that is to presume too much. Uh, I am arguing against the bourgeois narrative. And when you bring up like the Holodromor, he's like, oh, are you denying the historical narrative? It's like, yes, I'm denying the bourgeois historical narrative. <laughs> the, yeah. fact that, the fact that Vosh doesn't seem to understand that the Western media, the bourgeois media lies about communism is baffling to me. And I think he does understand this. He's just playing dumb. Right. Uh, this is, you know, just a standard Vosh tactic. He'll, he understands this, but he'll just play dumb because he knows that in order for you to um, try to make excuses or to defend the USSR or China, it will require you to do a whole lot more digging 
than it would him having to just hurl that shit at you and say, oh, well, what about Jing Zhang? What about the Uyghurs? What about the Halajamore dude? It's He's got the easiest job in the world. All he has to do is just bounce from, from you know, manufactured CIA phony genocide to manufactured phony CIA genocide, you know, mm. again and again and again. Um, and he, he did this continuously. Whenever he would get uncomfortable, he'd say, well, what about the Uyghurs? Oh, well, what about the Haladramor? Um, You know, yeah. what about the firing squads? Yada, yada, yada. And this, um, you know, it, it just shows that he will constantly put you on the defensive in that conversation by requiring you to have like a, a lengthy detailed explanation about these things. But the second that Caleb tried to explain uh, about the Uyghur situation or about the uh, Ukrainian famines, you know, Vosh would uh, look at the camera. He'd make a little snarky quip about, Oh really? We're going to go down this road. We're going to deny the official narrative. Hmm. Where have I heard that before? You know, it's just, yeah, he, he's dog whistling. He is trying to associate us with Holocaust deniers. And that whole association fails spectacularly under the slightest bit of a, objective examination. You don't have to dig very deep to see that all the sources about the Halajamor are bourgeois sources. And you don't have to dig deeper than that to realize that the bourgeois lies about communism. Put two and two together, kids, and... Uh, <laughs> have you know have a little bit of objective thought inside your head don't just believe the first new york times article that comes up on joseph stalin <laughs> as, right. as possible oh but it's the official narrative yeah it's the official narrative that has been funnel fed to you by the bourgeois by capitalists the and fact that this guy gives the official narrative any kind of credence whatsoever shows you that he's not really a leftist. Yeah. And on the topic of official narratives, that's why I pointed out that he was being so Western chauvinistic is because people don't seem to understand that's the common narrative here. Now, if you look at the Muslim world, now there was like 40, um, I can't remember. It was a whole like bunch of countries in Russia and a couple others, but the majority of them were actually um, Islamic countries for the most part. And they were concerned about this Xinjiang situation, particularly mm. Turkey. So they sent delegates and they went and looked at these places. And you can say the Chinese communist party just showed them what they wanted to see all you want. But nonetheless, all these countries pretty much came out of it and said, this seems like a good way to fight terrorism. This seems like a good way to build up the community and um, by giving them free access to like education and opportunities for jobs, this is the best way to fight terrorism. So the narrative in Islamic countries, for the most part, at least their governments, I guess you can say, is that this isn't so bad and that it's not a genocide. It's a very tense situation and it's not going to be neat and pretty. Right. But, yeah. There's no blue. I mean, yeah, that was my point on like what how the official narrative it doesn't it isn't always the same. It, it's not overarching, you know. It, it's very contended. But but, but see, uh, Vosh wouldn't trust those sources because they're not, you know, they're people. they're evil Muslim sources. <laughs> you know, he he wouldn't say that, but he does have this bias for the mainstream media. He has this bias for uh, the bourgeois. Obviously, he has this Western bias. Um, yeah. but yeah, we are about to wrap it up here, but, uh, are there any sort of closing remarks or statements that, that you have? Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know for me, I, I feel like we have to be able to understand, uh, what is happening, uh, about the what what has happened in the past about the Ukrainian famines, we have to be able to answer all of that stuff because it is the first thing that people will ask us, and we must uh, correct them when they equate us with Holocaust deniers because it is it is objectively false 
to deny the Holocaust. It's something that is so evidently true that you, uh, it is just absolutely unreasonable to do that. But the Holodromor, uh, thing, you know, things of that nature, it's absolutely valid to deny that because all of the sources we cite are bourgeois sources and they all are heavily biased and cannot be trusted. We've shown that they can't be trusted. The evidence isn't there and you have to follow the evidence. Now, you know, with regard to the whole Zhejiang situation, it's clear that most uh, delegates from the Islamic world think that what China is doing is, you know, good and, and, and at least not harmful. It's not a genocide, whereas the West, you know, they are purporting that this is, you know, a, a genocide of sorts. And I think some of the hallmarks that you would see of a genocide in Zhejiang would involve things like forbidding um, the worship uh, or practice of Islam. They would be destroying mosques. Instead, the Chinese government has constructed two new mosques in one of the major cities in Zhejiang. Um, you would see them banning Islamic names or uh, their native language you would see them forcing them to like eat pork and right. to adopt Han Chinese names and things along that nature. And you're not seeing that you're seeing the Chinese government sponsoring, um, you know, people from Zhejiang Uyghurs to go to vocational schools so that they can learn how to get a job so that they can receive a higher education. Uh, they're allowed to have visitors. It's not, like they are being kept at gunpoint in these situations. And at the same time, you have to consider what if the United States had a an entire state which was largely populated by Muslims? What would this government's response be? Um, it would probably be very, very nasty. So considering the you know, the, uh, what's it called? The compassion, not, not necessarily compassion, but just like the, uh, the care that the Chinese government has taken to preserve the Uyghurs culture while at the same time, uh, same time trying their best to integrate them into the wider Chinese society. I think, you know, it has been commended throughout the Islamic world and, I think ultimately it is a positive thing and we are not witnessing the cultural destruction of the Uyghur people. Uh, this, you know, this is directly contrasted with the U S government's treatment of the Islamic world, which, you know, consider if, if we want to call what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs, a genocide, what could we call the United States foreign policy towards the Islamic world for the past like 20 years? You know, drone strikes, uh, aggressive military occupation bases. I mean, you know, put 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 two and two together. Right. And of course, it's not in the scope of this video to totally talk about the Xinjiang situation. Um, you know, we're just talking about genocide claims a little more broadly and giving some examples, of course. But just to kind of, you know, since I mentioned it earlier and we, you know, it's very obvious that me and Danky here are defending China to a degree here. I just want to put it out here. Why? I mean, look, if you look at what is going on in Xinjiang, if you look at Western media, they're saying all those things that you mentioned earlier about them. Oh, they're banning this. And they're, I've actually seen that. Um, somebody was saying they're making them eat pork. Right. And look, I, I guess I find it very annoying whenever somebody like Vouch just goes on and talks like this, because I've learned that I have been very wrong about these countries in the past. And now I've learned that you actually have to do the research. You have to do the legwork. And unless you're going to talk about something firmly, you have to go through that process. And when you see somebody who doesn't, it's very frustrating. And if they would have done the research, take the situation in Xinjiang. I mean, they're saying it's a genocide, but really these vocational schools it is a way for them to integrate people into the society and give them a job opportunity and things like this. I mean, 
it, how how else are we supposed to fight against terrorism? You get what I'm saying? I mean, that seems like a very materialist economic way of solving the situation. Instead of saying, let's bomb them to death and their whole communities, let's build some schools so they can like, you know, develop themselves. Say these people are even forced. I mean, okay, we know that there are serious situations in Xinjiang. Well, I don't even know if people like Vaush know this, but there have been terrorist attacks for a long time now. Um, there's been people wielding knives, going around in gangs, just stabbing people to death, right? Um, explosions, stuff like this. So it's an extremely tense area. And there's a long history of this. Um, I, I encourage everybody to go check out the Gray Zones article on the Uyghur situation. Um, they go into depth about the history of this, how the there's a thing called the Uyghur Assembly, and they've been around since the 60s. And they essentially um, allied themselves with like fascist forces in Turkey. And they have now become such a big um, organization that they, um, for example, their heads have actually met with like George Bush in the past and stuff like this. So when you look at the people pushing this narrative, look at how this, we were talking about the Holodomor. We were talking about the Uyghur situation. Both of these situations, the, the narrative was built by nationalists on the ground who were sympathetic to fascism, who wanted to, you know, put, put their country or whatever state they were in, pretty much try and make them look bad. And the West is willing to accommodate because they have other interests. Sure, they maybe don't want to... The West doesn't care about building, building a Uyghur autonomous state or anything like exactly. that. Their interests just converge on this one point. So watch out for nationalism. Watch out for um, whenever these claims of genocide are made because they're used by Nazis more than you would expect. So when somebody like Vouch is saying, oh, I, I'm, I'm a good leftist, I'm good and moral because I defend the Uyghurs. Really, you're defending people in the Uyghur community, fair enough, who were sympathetic to fascism and sympathetic to just this ultra nationalism and um, Islamic terrorism. And you're not really allying <laughs> with a moral side like you think you are. So that's the ultimate irony here is that's why it's good to do this research is because you might end up fighting for the side that you really don't want to be on like Bausch did. Yep. It's, it's a lesson that we all need to learn. Well, thank you very much for listening to this conversation, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, leave a comment down below, like, favorite, subscribe. Make sure to check out FVK 1917's channel. I'll leave a link to that in the description and subscribe to him. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.